Hi, I'm Tess Somerville, and this is a short talk about William Cooper's 1785 poem, The Task. The Task is a long poem. It takes up an entire volume and is divided into six books. So this will just be a, a very brief introduction to the poem, what it's about, and why it's such a great poem for our times, as well as for Cooper's contemporaries and, of course, for Jane Austen. Um, I'd have loved to have got some video of lovely rural scenes and to have narrated this as I walked in the countryside, um, as Cooper describes doing in the poem. But we are still in a, in a pandemic, I can't really go anywhere. Um, so I'm actually recording this from my sofa. But that's actually very apt because the task is a poem about sofas. At least it starts off that way before it wanders off into other subjects. So this is the start of the poem, the opening of book one. I sing the sofa, I who lately sang truth, hope and charity, and touched with all the solemn chords, and with a trembling hand escaped with pain from that adventurous flight, now seek repose upon an humbler theme. So why would Cooper write an epic poem about a sofa? Well, his shorter poems uh, in the 1782 volume poems were, were all rhyming poems. And then in 1783, one of his friends, Lady Austen, no relation of Jane, told him he should write a poem in blank verse, that is, in unrhymed lines of iambic pentameter, in the tradition of Milton. So Cooper said, OK, what shall I write this blank verse poem about? Lady Austen said jokingly, how about a sofa? So that was the task that Cooper was set, hence the name of the poem. So Cooper says he's going to use the same form that Milton used in Paradise Lost to write a poem about a sofa. And that, I think, is inherently quite funny. But the task is not mock epic, at least not straightforwardly mock epic. Uh, mock epic being when a poet uses the epic form to write about trivial subjects as a way of making those subjects look even more silly. The Task is a poem that is very serious about the importance of its theme. Its theme being not just the sofa, but domesticity, the pleasures of a quiet life at home. The heroism, in fact, of a quiet life at home. Friends, books, a garden, and perhaps his pen, delightful industry enjoyed at home, and nature in her cultivated trim dressed to his taste, inviting him abroad. Can he want occupation who has these? Will he be idle who has much to enjoy? Me, therefore, studious of laborious ease, not slothful, happy to deceive the time, not waste it, and aware that human life is but a loan to be repaid with use, when he shall call his debtors to account, from whom are all our blessings. I like that line, studious of laborious ease. Cooper is very concerned to say that leisure can be worthwhile and virtuous. His are higher pleasures. He's relaxing, but he's also being productive. He's not just slobbing around on a sofa watching reality TV. He's reclining on this sofa, reading epic poetry and writing his own epic poem. I mean, we're all here uh, spending our free time attending a study day on William Cooper. We too are studious of laborious ease. This is time well spent enriching our minds, not just wasting time. But you can see here, I think, a hint that Cooper is maybe protesting too much. He's a bit self-conscious about whether his life of leisure really is a good use of time. When God calls him to account for his life, can he really say, well, I spent about a year writing a poem about a sofa? And the value of his own poem and the time spent writing it and the time people will have to spend reading it is something that troubles him throughout this poem. So the first few hundred lines of the task are about sofas and how the sofa evolved from stools and hard chairs. And then he moves on to how, even if your sofa is very comfortable, you should still take your daily walk. And then books two to six are about other domestic pleasures, like gardening, reading the paper by a warm fire with a cup of tea, 
keeping pets and so on. I mean, really, this is the perfect lockdown poem. The whole poem is an argument that these small domestic subjects are worthy of being celebrated in poetry. But these descriptions of his domestic pleasures are interspersed with reflections on politics, religion, morals, huge topical issues like slavery and the slave trade, war, social inequality, poverty, animal cruelty, environmental degradation. And Cooper is aware that there's a tension between his awareness of those bigger issues and his own life of retirement. So the task is about the pleasures of staying at home, but also about the guilt of staying at home and being leisurely when important and terrible things are going on in the world. It's a feeling that I think is very relatable. Here's an example of how Cooper negotiates between these contradictory feelings. In book three, The Garden, he spends over a hundred lines describing how to grow cucumbers. And he talks about how in the winter, when they're out of season, is when uh, rich people in the cities want cucumbers because they're rare. They become a luxury item in the winter because they're so difficult to grow. To raise the prickly and green-coated gourd so grateful to the palate, and when rare so coveted, else base and disesteemed, food for the vulgar merely, is an art that toiling ages have but just matured, and at this moment unassayed in song. Clearly Cooper knows that these lines are silly, you know, this notion that the art of growing cucumbers is unassayed in song is quite funny. But his actual lines on the cucumber are this very strange combination of humorously self-deprecating and deadly serious. So Cooper says, I know this seems frivolous, but actually cucumbers are quite important and tell us a lot about society. Grudge not, ye rich, since luxury must have his dainties, and the world's more numerous half lives by contriving delicates for you. Grudge not the cost. Ye little know the cares, the vigilance, the labour, and the skill that day and night are exercised, and hang upon the ticklish balance of suspense, that ye may garnish your profuse regales with summer fruits brought forth by wintry suns. This is a real celebration of the skill and work that goes into Cooper's hobby, his hobby of growing cucumbers. And he says that when you're enjoying food, especially food that's out of season, you need to appreciate that someone has worked hard to produce it. But I think there's also a growing sense of something potentially unethical about Cooper's hobby. He's putting all this effort into growing luxury food for rich people. But as he says elsewhere in the poem, people in the countryside are starving because all the food that's grown is being sent to the cities and people are growing these valuable fancy things um, instead of the basics that people need to survive. And as he goes on, this anxiety about the value of his gardening turns into anxiety about the value of the poem itself. So he says, OK, I need to stop writing about cucumbers now, because if I go on any more, the learned and wise sarcastic would exclaim and judge the song cold as its theme and like its theme, the fruit of too much labour, worthless when produced. People would say you're putting too much time and effort into this poem about cucumbers, just as you put too much time and effort into actually growing cucumbers. But Cooper's already written about a hundred lines about cucumbers by the time we get to this, so is he saying that everything we've just read about cucumbers has been a waste of time? These are doubts that Cooper has about both his lifestyle and his poem. They're both lovely, but are they both useless? Should he be spending his time not growing cucumbers or writing poetry about cucumbers, but getting out there and doing something useful? But I think ultimately his faith in the value of this kind of life, a quiet life that appreciates small beautiful things, his faith in that wins out in the task. Cooper's conclusion is that being good is better than being great. The man whose virtues are more felt than seen must drop indeed the hope of public praise, 
but he may boast what few that win it can, that if his country stand not by his skill, at least his follies have not wrought her fall. The conclusion he comes to is that while you might feel like you're not doing anything important, appreciating the world around you and being kind to those around you is a noble way of living, worthy of an epic poem. It's no wonder then, I think, that this poem was beloved by Jane Austen, as it's about the importance and the profundity, as well as the frustrations, of a restricted domestic life. And it's about how small domestic things touch upon and open up into the most enormous social and political questions. Cooper's poem says that if you think about a sofa long and hard enough, you'll end up thinking about religion, ethics, life and death. The task is loved particularly by Austen's most humble, self-effacing heroine, Fanny in Mansfield Park, uh, who quotes it when she's lamenting Mr Rushworth's plans uh, to improve the park at Southerton by cutting down the avenue of trees. She says, cut down an avenue, what a pity. Does it not make you think of Cooper? You've fallen avenues, once more I mourn your fate unmerited. I think Austin has Fanny quote Cooper there, and specifically the task, almost as a way to signal that Everyone may think this quiet, retiring person isn't worth notice, but in fact such a person and the life they lead is more interesting and insightful and valuable than the lives of those around her. So it's clear why the task would speak to people like Austin and indeed Fanny, and I think it speaks to our present moment as well, and certainly to the last year here in the UK where a lot of people have been spending a lot more time at home feeling powerless and a frustrating sense of helplessness in the face of so much that's going on in the world, but also trying to find pleasure and value in small domestic things. And Cooper says that reading poetry, even a really long poem like The Task, is a worthwhile use of time. Thank you very much.